thank you for having me here tonight. Um, as he said, I am Travis Foley from Independence, Missouri with the Oregon California Trails Association. My hometown is Lexington, Missouri. So, you know, the Missouri River has been my backyard for much of my life. I have lived other places, but I was drawn back to Missouri a number of years ago and haven't yet regretted that. You know, Lexington was, a, much like Kansas City, kind of trail center. Santa Fe Trail was my backyard. Lewis and Clark Trail was my front yard. The founders of the Pony Express and their trail were right there from my hometown, so I had it around me my whole life. And as he was saying, you know, this is a history, it is science, it is recreation, and it is the Missouri River watershed. So I'm going to start you off off the river a little bit before I get to a vision that I've had for what we might do along the Missouri River. Now, all of these historic trails, the reason they were jumping off from here were really twofold. It was the meeting place for the Missouri and Kansas River. It's where the Missouri River bends to the north. It was also the westernmost part of the United States up till 1854. You know, the state line was Indian Territory. It was not part of, the, part of the United States government. So these trails got their start in 1821 out in central Missouri in a town that no longer exists, Franklin, just across from where Boonville is today. One of enterprising farmer said, you know, the Mexicans have just won their freedom from Spain and agriculture prices here aren't the best. I will take my goods to market in Santa Fe. And so that was the beginning of the Santa Fe Trail, and it, of course, coursed right through here. And you'll notice the map that I have up here has multiple lines, and there are multiple trails and multiple variants of trails. I always talk about trails at either end here in Santa Fe and in California and Oregon as two ends of an unbraided rope. It, it kind of a lot of different jumping off places along the Missouri River, a lot of different places that people were going on the west end. There are three main jumping off points in the Kansas City metro area. The first is up there on the far right. It's kind of a purple line, and that is the Blue Mills Landing. If you were to go U.S. Highway 24 through Independence to the very eastern edge of town to Blue Mills Road and follow that to about where it peters out and where the Little Blue River dumps into the Missouri, that's where the Blue Mills Landing was. And it was used for a bit in the 1830s, 1840s. A little farther west in the town of Sugar Creek, where the Lafarge cement plant is today, was a town that's no longer there. It was called Wayne City. There was a natural wharf there, and up till the 1850s it was heavily used, and it was the four and a half mile trail that took you to the Independence Square, which most people around the world regard as the beginning of the Oregon Trail. Um, a little further west than that is what was called the Westport Landing, and that was the landing that brought people to where we are right now, to Westport. Uh, the Westport Landing today is, can still be seen. The ruins of the buildings that were there are still there. It was called Town of Kansas then. It's basically where the Town of Kansas pedestrian bridge goes right out to the edge of the river. If you turn around and look back, you'll see the ruins of some of those buildings. What we're endeavoring to do, at least on what we call the Independence Route, which is the yellow and, and red dotted line, is to rebuild, to retrace that 40-mile corridor of the shared experience of the Santa Fe, Oregon, and California Trail from Sugar Creek to Gardner, Kansas, a distance of about 40 miles. As I go through this tonight, you'll see a lot of different things that we've already done along the way and plans that we have, but the key things to know are, one, the Katy Trail extension is going to happen. Jackson County last month uh, arranged to buy the 17-mile uh, rail line that runs it's through Lee Summit and Raytown up to Arrowhead Stadium and that's going to happen in short order. So that will bring the Katy Trail into Kansas City, and we will connect to that at 63rd and Blue Ridge in Raytown. Raytown has its own master plan of its redoing its entire downtown, uh, and it's all really economic development. That's mostly what we're talking about here, is economic development, recreation, history, and as we'll see in a little bit, even, even some science. Now those three National Historic Trails were designated by Congress beginning in 1978, and there's a fourth National Historic Trail, one of which you're all very familiar with, I'm sure, and that's the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail, of which we obviously touch in several places. So we do have different types of National Historic Trail development, and I should back up and say there is a National Trails Act that was passed by Congress in 1968, signed by President Johnson, and it's been amended numerous times since then. First in 1978, when they created National Historic Trails, when you got the Oregon Trail and the Lewis and Clark Trail, the Mormon, Mormon Pioneer Trail, and I will, I will forget the fourth one and omit it for now. 
But now there are 19 National Historic Trails, there are 11 National Scenic Trails, things like the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, in 49 states. The only state that's left out right now is Indiana. There is a movement to move the Lewis and Clark Trail back to what many people view as its beginning at Monticello, at Jefferson's home, which would obviously go up the Ohio River and, and put Indiana into the system. So what we have here in the Kansas City metro area really is the first attempt to actually do what Congress intended, which is to retrace these trails, especially the historic trails, where a lot of times there's very few, if any, remnants left. In the Kansas City area, it's very hard to see remnants. There are some, and I'll show you. The first type of thing that we're doing on top is typically 10-foot wide hiking, biking trail in the rights of way along basically where the trail used to go. It's not always right where it was. A lot of times trails go through people's homes today, people's businesses, other types of development, and it's not always practicable. But Congress did allow for building retracement trail as close as is practical to the original route. The second type is the actual sites. What you're looking at there in the middle picture is at 85th and Manchester in South Kansas City. It's a very deep wagon swell, several, several feet deep, that courses up the hill to the southwest, very near Hickman Mills School District buildings. And of course, signing and marking is an important component of this, and this is the western edge of what we're talking about tonight, and that's at Gardner Junction, just a little bit west of the town of Gardner, Kansas, a park that was built about 10 years ago or so. So there's the definition of what a retracement trail is. I won't read it, but it's basically a recreating a walking, hiking, biking experience in a historic trail corridor. Things like the Red Bridge Project in South Kansas City, where when the new bridge was built, the, the decision was made to retrofit the old Red Bridge as a hiking-biking bridge, but also to put pedestrian facilities on both sides of the driving bridge and include historic trail exhibits, as well as about 12 biographies of, imp of important people to the trail experience that you can see today. Those others are what the trail kind of looks like farther west, different types of retracements that you see in other parts of the country. This map shows really what's existing already. The dark green is trail that's built. You'll notice, and we'll get to this in a little bit, why this is. South Kansas City has a lot. The light green is stuff that's planned, and the orange is, is proposed. And you can see Independence and Raytown lag behind, and Johnson County seems non-existent, though that's not entirely true. The reason South Kansas City is so far ahead is that a number of years ago, the city of Kansas City created what they call the Three Trails Community Improvement District. They saw the Three Trails as an opportunity to redevelop the area, and you can see that happening today with things like the Cerner Project that's eventually going to build out millions of square foot of office space, have 14,000 employees, and completely reinvent that neighborhood. But they saw this long ago as a, as a chance for economic redevelopment when the highways, what used to be called Grandview Triangle, were redesigned, it was even renamed the Three, the three, trails, three trails Highway. So that's been in the process for a long time. They actually have a plan just for the city of Kansas City. You can see a piece of that there where they divide it into small segments. This segment happens to be almost two-thirds of a mile. It gives its location, where, what its significance and issues are, where it connects, and the opportunities that lie around along that. We are in the process now of working with the Mid-America Regional Council and the National Park Service to fund a landscape architect to begin doing that in places like Sugar Creek and Independence and Raytown and Johnson County. And, and soon we'll have a book just like this, and you can find this on the city's website, of what that plan, where that trail will eventually be. So there is the original trail through South Kansas City in that yellow and red dotted line, and the Green, light green, and orange is where the proposed and actually developed hiking, biking trail is. As you can see, the trail largely cuts through Kansas City at a southwest angle. The problem is Kansas City is largely laid out on a north, south, east, west grid. So as I said, you're often going through people's homes, yards, businesses, so you have to sort of build around that and connect to, and what we're really attempting to do is connect to those remaining historic sites, buildings, graves, wagon ruts, things of that nature. This shows the, the segments that are built so far or proposed uh, in their mileage. So at Hickman Mills, for example, the, the junior high there, there's hiking, biking trail, there's large cutout silhouettes in steel that, that show the, the immigrant experience. 
a lot of people call them pioneers. I think the actual historical term is immigrants. People were emigrating with an E to a foreign land. Got to keep in mind they were going to Santa Fe and California and Oregon before they were really parts of the United States. This is at Schumacher Park along 93rd Street in South Kansas City as it was being built. That section of trail is now built. It will connect right into the Cerner property. At uh, 435, a very, very neat project. This will be called the Powder Mill Bridge. Right at Bannister Road, the bridge is almost done. It will be the nation's first pedestrian-only bridge built specifically over an interstate for a National Historic Trail. There'll be a big ribbon cutting for that next June, and we hope to have a lot of dignitaries from around the country for for this because National Historic Trails, by and large, are administered by the National Park Service. And next year is the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. So we hope to have a lot of festivities around this first of its kind in the nation type of thing. Hearts Grove is a really important site. If you know the Bannister Mall, old Bannister Mall area where the Home Depot is, just behind that is a little creek and it's called Hearts Grove. And Hearts Grove was generally one of the first campgrounds people would come to one day out of independence. And people such as the Donner Party, for example, camp there, and it is interpreted, and it is in a park setting. Um, this was built before it was an interstate. It was US 71. It was part of the realignment of, that, of those highways down there a number of years ago, and there is a pedestrian bridge there. Of course, Scott Park in South Kansas City. This shows how the complexity of getting across a big interstate system, but it is being done. Alex George Lake in Gambrel Track Park has a little bit different surface. We're, we're always looking at a variety of surfaces, whether it's paved, whether it's stone, crushed gravel, dirt. You'll see all, all different things. Of course, I've spoken about Red Bridge already. Avila University has really seized upon this. They've built the trail along the south side of their campus where the three trails went. Now they're building completely around the campus to have hiking and biking opportunities for their students and people in the neighborhood. Jumping back up to the, the actual jumping off point, we see Sugar Creek and Independence. I tend to think of them as, as one since Independence really surrounds Sugar Creek. Uh, River Road is more or less the, the trail. Uh, there is a proposed route to take you up that to what's now called Mill Creek Park where the green line begins, down to McCoy Park which almost takes you to the square. There is actually hiking, biking trail already built there. At the north end of that, at Mill Creek Park, there is a proposed development to build 50 duplexes for senior citizens. So we have ready-made almost probably 100 new people that will live adjacent to the trail with easy access to the Truman Library, the Independence Square, parks, and the National Historic Trail experience right in their backyard. Other potential segments, obviously Blue Ridge Boulevard through Raytown is the trail. The, the trail followed the highland between the Little and Big Blue, the Blue Ridge, as it's called. Uh, the wagons didn't want to get caught in the muck. They didn't have paved, paved roads, so they tended the state of the high ground. And you can see it's coursing to the southwest out through Johnson County. There's the Blue Ridge Boulevard section. The city of Raytown's already building that 51st to 59th Street section. The 59th to 63rd extensions will be part of that redevelopment that the city of Raytown announced about a month ago. It's going to completely realign how Blue Ridge and 63rd come together, redo all the storefronts, the sidewalks. It's going to be a whole new experience in downtown Raytown. And of course, the Independence route there is the southern route coming out through Johnson County, and the Westport route is what you see the purple line up to the north. And they come together at Gardner, and then they separate again. The Santa Fe Trail continues to the southwest towards Baldwin City, whereas the Oregon and California Trail turn west towards Lawrence and Topeka before they head up into Nebraska. That little section was called the Eye of the Needle. Pretty much anyone who was, everyone who was anyone heading west, half a million people went through that one little section of trail there at the Gardner Junction. But you can see the big challenge is the way Johnson County's laid out, which is largely cul-de-sacs and dead-end streets, and it's very difficult to actually build trail through the neighborhoods. So we're looking at alternatives. And again, probably following waterways. Tomahawk Creek, Indian Creek already have trails. They're very close to where the actual historic trail is. Congress does allow for as close as is practicable, and that is really close. And we'll probably use those portions to, to punch through Johnson County. Then, of course, there's the other route that takes you down through downtown Westport, following Warnell Road down to Avila. That was another wagon road on the way out of town. 
So our future trail considerations, there's value in having a plan. The city of Kansas City, as you've seen, is far, far ahead because they've had a plan for a long time. There's potential trail alignments in proximity to the historic route. There's lots of trail alignments that we could propose. The Katy Trail, for example, and what I'm going to talk about in a little bit, trail along the Missouri River. Possibility of connecting to other National Historic Trails, not just the, the Lewis and Clark Trail with the three trails, but further north up into St. Joe, you run into the Pony Express Trail. Farther north from that, once you get to Council Bluffs, you run into the Mormon Pioneer Trail. Um, heading back out to St. Louis and down the Mississippi, you run into the Trail of Tears. Missouri has bits and pieces of at least six National Historic Trails, which makes it unique in, in America. It's the only state to have that distinction. But then there's the feasibility factors, access and right-of-way. We're fortunate that a lot of the modern roads in Kansas City follow very close to the original route, so there is existing right-of-way to do this. The other piece that we've been tackling over the last many years is jurisdictional interest. Ten years ago, 12 years ago, when I really started doing this as a full-time endeavor, I couldn't really get anyone anywhere to return a phone call. Now I have mayors and city council people and even congressmen and state legislatures calling me wondering how we can get this funded and how we can get this done, which leads us to the biggest issue, funding. It's a, it's a multi-million, multi-year project. Just that bridge alone over, over uh, Red Bridge was a $27 million project. The bridge over 435 is a million dollar project. It's, it's not as inexpensive as trails sound. They actually cost a lot more, especially considering we have to deal with an urban environment to get this done. So I'm going to show you a few of the current projects underway in the 6th District before I jump back up to the Missouri River, the 6th District of Kansas City, of course. The Cerner project is, is well underway. Um, they've, they've really done a great job of, of, of getting that going, and I, th I know the neighborhood is really excited. It was a part of Kansas City that was once great. It sort of started falling apart in the 80s, and now here we are in 2015 with a plan to revive it. The Powder Mill Bridge, which I mentioned, is just about complete. There's some final inspections and some final little minor things being done, but for the most part, if you drive by there today, it looks very, very close to done. The Greenway, just to the west of 435 along Bannister Road, there's a plan to take that trail on down the hill towards Highway 71. Along at Red Bridge and Holmes, there's a shopping center at the southwest corner that is being redeveloped, and that sidewalk will be widened to 10 foot wide and take you all the way down to Santa Fe Trail Drive, which takes you over to Avila. There are, of course, as I mentioned, a lot of historic sites and interpretive sites that can be seen, and really what we're attempting to do with this hiking, biking trail is to connect those. There's a lot of kind of dead space in between where you know the wagons were just trudging along until they came to the next stop. Places like the Rice Tremonti House in Raytown or Cave Springs, which was, a, which was a campground in Raytown, or the Independent Square where they were getting outfitted, or the Gardner Junction where they were making their choice to go southwest or west or northwest. As you can see, the entire metro area is really just sprinkled with these great historic sites, maybe things that you don't think about as a trail historic, the Shawnee Indian Mission, for example. One of the reasons Westport is where it is is they were that was that McCoy was intercepting traffic from the Shawnee Indian mission of, of American Indians, Indians going to Independence to trade. Well, they were a lot closer to Westport, obviously, and, and this was a place they could stop to get trade goods. And there's the interpretive sites that we have so far and a lot more on the drawing block that are coming soon. There are different kinds of signs that we've been enacting all over town that you've probably seen from stone monument signs to street signs, to even the great daughters of the American Revolution who really were the first to endeavor to mark the trail. But that marker there in the lower right corner is at Schumacher Park along 93rd Street, and it's been there since 1909, as has the one at Cave Spring, um, as have a number of others in the metro area and all across the country. So the DAR is still a partner with us, and they've helped fund for example, on the lower left there, the National Historic Standard Road sign, they funded the post for that, and those are in Sugar Creek, and those were about $7,000 worth of posts that the DAR paid for. The signs themselves are funded by the National Park Service. There are grants available for communities. If you live in a community, say in Johnson County, where we don't currently have any signs, I would love to talk to you about how we might be able to get them, but pretty much the Missouri side, we already have it all signed, or as is the case with Kansas City, we have the signs purchased and they're waiting to be installed. And these are what the different types of signs look like. It tells you when you're on the original route. It tells you when on a hiking trail section. It points you to the historic sites. 
It's, again, it's about economic development. Many people come to this area seeking out an Oregon Trail or a Santa Fe Trail or a Lewis and Clark or California Trail experience. Prior to the last couple of years, it's been very difficult to deliver that to them. Um, we think now with concerted sign packaging that someone will be able to get in their car and hopefully one day their bike or their hiking shoes and do this without even need of a map. We have our currently installed National Park Service interpretive panels. Again, the National Park Service is a partner in all that we do, and they fund, they not only fund the signs, but they actually have graphic designers and layout people and manufacturing facilities that all of these things are created. We often write them here locally and select the images for them, but then they're actually laid out in the Park Service offices in Santa Fe. Back up to the Missouri River. There's the Wayne City Landing uh, as envisioned roughly 1840s. You can still see the natural wharf there if you know where you're looking. Um, it's kind of buried in the woods these days along the riverfront. As I mentioned earlier, that is largely Lafarge. I think today it's called Talon Corporation. The name changes from year to year. And then at the top of the hill, where the actual town of Wayne City was, on Lafarge slash Talon's property, is a little park where we commemorate what the Wayne City Landing was. And very nearby was an island where Lewis and Clark camped. So this is a spot, a special spot, where four National Historic Trails all come together. A little farther south, I mentioned the original route signs that are up. These are in Raytown. The Rice Tremonti home, of course, was a, was a famous stop on the, on the trail. The cabin there in front, in case you've never been there, was, is Aunt Sophie's cabin. And Aunt Sophie was the Rice family's slave. And She's mentioned in many trail journals as a person who cooked for people along the trail and they could get hot, hot meals from them. And then just to the south of there is where Cave Springs was where people often camped. But they also camped there on the, uh, the Dr. Rice uh, on his farm. It was uh, hundreds of acres in, in those days. At 85th and Manchester is a great little piece of, of trail that if you go out there, it's, it's just off Blue Ridge Boulevard behind uh, the Blue Ridge Baptist Church. There's about 150 meters of very deep swell going up the side of the hill. There used to be more. The uh, Blue Ridge Baptist Church decided to build a soccer field on top of where the rest of the trail used to be, and we couldn't really do anything to stop them. The one thing the National Trails Act really lacks is legal jurisdiction to stop private landowners from doing what they want with their property. But luckily, the swales there, pronounced Wiedewelt swells for the Wiedewelt family who formerly owned them, are now owned by Cave Springs and soon to be transferred to the city of Kansas City as a park. And then, of course, at Hickman Mills, I've shown you some pieces there, Schumacher Park, and New Santa Fe at 123rd and State Line. New Santa Fe was actually a town during the trail era. It's uh, 123rd and State Line, right where Kansas City and Leewood come together. That was the end, of the end of the United States. That was your last chance to get provisions before you headed off into Indian territory. And Olathe, the city of Olathe, has really seized upon this idea. They've spent millions of dollars in developing their trail resources. One of the places they bought a number of years ago was the Lone Elm Campground. It was, at the time, a, a Lone Elm. It's now a lot of trees, but people would camp there in their wagon trains. And they developed it into a, a sports facility, soccer fields, softball fields, things of that nature. But they also set aside a lot of acres to interpret the trail history that was there. Other assets that they have there in town are the Mahaffey Stagecoach Stop, which they've beautifully restored, which has tens of thousands of school children go through it every year. They built a $3 million education center adjacent to it with brand new soccer fields across from it. So now they really almost have year-round tourists going through there. These soccer families come from all over the country. They've got hours between games. What else are they going to do but go across the street and learn about the trail history of Kansas City? It was a stroke of genius as far as I'm concerned with what the city of Olathe did. And then, of course, the western edge of our project area, the 40-mile swath, the Gardner Junction Park. The, I'll skip over some of this um, largely because I know a lot of you probably want to go see the baseball game, and I want to really get up to where we are today with economic development and what we might do along the Missouri River. Outdoor recreation obviously is a huge piece of the economy, $646 billion a year, and 62% 60 of the people who recreate outdoors, plan an overnight stay, spending an average of $124 per night. Businesses along trails have seen 
a substantial increase in spending from 34 to 41 a 34 to 41 percent increase in at two years. Uh, a substantial piece of that is, is international. One of the case studies the National Park Service undertook is a thing called the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, something I'm sure hardly any of you have heard of, but a very important piece of American history. The British, during the Revolutionary War, announced that they were going to march onto the west side of the Appalachians and burn the farms. Well, the guys on that side didn't really take too kindly to that. And of course, they've been hunting squirrels and rabbits with muskets, so they had really great accuracy. So they marched over the mountains, they mustered up, they marched hundreds of miles to Kings Mountain, South Carolina, where they defeated the king's, the king's men. And it was really the beginning of the end for England. And that was really the turning point of the war. Thomas Jefferson often reported, re referred to it as the most important battle of the war. Well, it is commemorated today as a National Historic Trail. And as you can see from the numbers, overall 20% repeat visitors in a two-year period. 20, almost 22% were unplanned visits, an average of $49 per person a day in spending. And 43.7% of all spending are, were visitors from outside the county visited. People are following these trails. They're learning these stories. It's our job as historians and as activists to really promote these as an economic development tool, which is what the National Park Service has done in this case study. A little closer to home, the Katy Trail, 240 miles long. I think everybody's very familiar with it. 400,000 visitors a year. Total economic impact of about $18.5 million a year supporting 367 jobs with $5 million in payroll with an average daily spending of $57 per person. Very substantial. We're building that into Kansas City. We're talking about connecting that with our three National Historic Trails. And we're gonna talk about building that out along the Missouri River. And I think really reinvigorating a lot of communities that are struggling in places. One of those communities is Sugar Creek. This is the 291 bridge at Labanit Park. There is a 1.7 mile hiking trail along the riverfront there. I'm sure maybe some of you have been there. There's a great boat launch. This is right near the boat launch. That interpretive panel talks about Lewis and Clark. This is the trailhead at the far east end of the parking lot that heads off down the Missouri River. There's more interpretation scattered along the way. As you can see, I was out there, I think, Friday. What a beautiful setting. There were people out there fishing. There were people out there bow hunting. There were people out there hiking. There's a nice park bench overlooking the river, some interpretation. There are picnic facilities out there. Further, a little further west, the Wayne City Landing. Last year, we had the Eagle Scout project, built the Wayne City Landing Monument. It's the entrance to the park. The park itself has a winding trail with interpretation, park benches, and at the far north end there at the fence is an overlook of the Missouri River. And there again is the Wayne City Landing as it looked, one of the interpretive panels there talking about Lewis and Clark, of course. One of the ways in which we draw people to a lot of these sites, geocaching has become extremely popular. Um, we're getting a lot of people that may not know about or care about our National Historic Trails visiting these sites because they do care about geocaching. And they're learning a lot along the way and they wind up following an entire trail because of geocaches. And as you can see, when we build a, a site like this, it takes a lot of people and a lot of effort. That's just a short list of the partners that were involved in this one park. That one park alone took well over a dozen different partners to accomplish. And there's the overlook, looking down on the Missouri River just a couple of days ago. Now, when you leave Wayne City Landing, there are signs intermittent along River Boulevard and other places that tell you that you are on the original route for the next two and a half miles. More or less, you know, River Road was was planned to get you to the Independence Square, and so we know exactly where it was. We were surveyed very early. Um, the early Jackson County history of 1878 talks in great detail about Wayne City Landing, about the River Road route into the Independence Square. One of the great things that has happened, I think, along the way is at what the old Gilpin town was a plotted town that never really happened. Gilpin was a was a guy who dreamed big. He thought he was going to intercept the trail traffic heading to Independence there in Sugar Creek and create something named for himself. He wound up basically absconding with the money and going to Colorado. But there was a little building left behind, and the mayor of Sugar Creek bought that building and created a winery. So what you see there in the background are his grapes, and the building behind that is the actual winery, Mallinson Manor Winery. The trail is going to pass right in front of it when it's built. It's just like Roachport, just like Herman. It's connecting up sites, historic sites, but entrepreneurs are coming along and putting in the winery, the brewery, the bed and breakfast, 
the bike rental facility, the campground, the other things that before the Katy Trail didn't exist in central Missouri. At the north end of, of uh, Independence is Mill Creek Park. That is the beginning of the trailhead. That trail was built a lot of years before we ever asked the city of Independence if we could use it for our purposes. It isn't on the National Historic Trail. The road you see there in the front runs to the west. That's called Jones Road. It goes up a couple hundred meters up the hill to River Boulevard. But the, the houses are very close to River Boulevard. It was very impractical to build hiking, biking trail. So we asked the city of Independence if we could mark the existing trail they'd already built to connect McCoy Park and Truman Library to Mill Creek Park, three quarters of a mile, if we could mark that as our National Historic Trail. Because Congress, as I said, does allow for us to have trail as close as is practical to the original route. And this was as close as was practical. There it is at the entrance of the Truman Library at Highway 24. And there's, when I turned around, that's the next picture I took. So you can see it's connecting up other great sites. And I should mention, Harry Truman himself, before he was a senator, before he was vice president, before he was president, was a county judge. He was also the Missouri chapter president of the American Pioneer Trails Association. He was involved in trails all the way back in the 1920s. I have great video footage that I found of him on YouTube out in Lexington, Missouri in 1929, dedicating the Madonna of the Trail statue and giving a speech that day. His grandfather, Solomon Young, who actually owned Cave Springs at one time in Raytown in the 1870s, was a trader on the Santa Fe Trail. His wife, Bess's parents, were also, or grandparents, were also involved in the Santa Fe Trail trade. So even a guy like Harry Truman has very deep trail routes. Pretty much anybody who was in this area early on did. This is at McCoy Park there across from the Truman Library. This was a gazebo that was already in use by the City of Independence, for, and they rented it out for picnics. But as you can see, it's right next door to somebody's house. And the people who lived there really got tired of having hundreds of cars and lots of noise. So the city allowed us to retrofit that. What you see in there are six exhibit panels that talk about the trail, and that is our McCoy Park trailhead. That's one of the stand-ups that shows the map of, of the trail through Sugar Creek and Independence. Up on the Independence Square, there's little pieces of history hidden everywhere. This is Dave's Bakery and Deli, where I had lunch today. Right next to that is, a, is an old plaque. I think it's from 1952 or thereabouts. It's in stone. What it talks about is in 1849, some guys with great entrepreneurial spirit built the very first railroad west of the Mississippi. It ran from the Wayne City Landing to the Independence Square. Its roundabout was right in front of where Dave's Bakery is today. It was mule drawn. It wasn't steam or, or coal or anything like that. It was drawn by mules. It was about a 4% grade all the way to the square. And of course, there's Harry Truman in front of the Independence Courthouse, and there on the lower left-hand corner is his courtroom. But of course, the lawn is marked with all sorts of monuments to the trail. The Oregon Trail began here. The Santa Fe Trail ran right past here. This is also where a lot of people were jumping off during the California Gold Rush. Jumping back over to the Westport Landing, the route that we're sitting on, the Westport route, the town of Kansas was founded at basically what's now the River Market area. There's the town of Kansas Bridge. I'm sure all of you have been there. And there are a number of interpretive panels there on the upper part and on the lower part on the walking trail portion as well. But you can see the cut that was cut through the bluffs to get, to get goods from the river up into Westport, and a town grew up around it. And if you look back past the railroad tracks, past the flood wall, back along the tree line, you can see some stones. That's, that's some of the old foundations from the town of Kansas, back from the 1840s and 50s. Still there, barely, barely viewed these days, but that's viewed from up on the town of Kansas Bridge. Walk out to the end, turn around and look back, and you'll see it. And there's the town of Kansas Bridge from down below, next to the flood wall. Of course, there's a lot of interpretation along that, the Berkeley Riverfront Park over towards the casino, talking about all the different trails, talking about the flora and fauna. And again, the Lewis and Clark expedition was a military expedition. It was also a science expedition. Lewis was a trained botanist. He was trained in medicine. He was trained in, in astronomy. He was a very learned man. He was, sec he was secretary, personal secretary to Thomas Jefferson. So this was a science and exploration um, voyage and they did camp very nearby. Now, one of the problems we have when we build new stuff is some people like to break it. I took this on Saturday. This is a exhibit panel about the different fish of the Missouri River, and um, it, it, it was actually somebody, it looked like they tried to put it back together. It was very windy on Saturday, and it blew over as I walked past, and so I noticed it. 
And then, of course, the city market itself was very lively Saturday when I was down there, but it's, it's commemorated for, for what its, its role in helping to build Kansas City is. Um, of course, one of the great amenities that we have in Kansas City, probably one of the greatest museums in the country, is the Steamboat Arabia, which was taking goods up to Nebraska City to sell in Nebraska City for people heading west on, on the trail. Nebraska City was another jumping off point. It sunk up in what's now Leavenworth County and was dug up a number of years ago. And there's a great museum there now, and there's the restored paddle wheel from, from that ship. But that's all part of this National Historic Trail experience along the Missouri River. Of course, this is in the River Market. You've probably seen this building. The entire city block is a large Lewis and Clark mural up at Case Park overlooking the junction of the two rivers, this great, wonderful Lewis and Clark statue. Of course, we're reincorporating other history. The WPA actually built that park in 1941. And there you are looking down at the Missouri River and off towards the junction with the Kansas River. That's on one of the exhibit panels along Berkeley Riverfront Park. I wish I could take claim for that photo because it's such a great one, but I didn't. But uh, it really, I think, captures the ethos of what, what it is I hope to accomplish, not, with, not just with the three trails, but with what we could do with the Lewis and Clark Trail. Of course, Call Point Park on the Kansas side. It's really gotten strange. They're building a brand new warehouse. It's really hard to access now. It was always hard to access. It's getting even harder. But it was great the day I was out there. There were canoeists launching that afternoon using the river as I kind of envision it being used in a more widespread fashion. Of course, there's the silhouette of Lewis and Clark. And all the men who were and women who were with Lewis and Clark are commemorated in the amphitheater there. Their names are on each of the stones. Up further in Parkville, there's a lot of riverfront development. This is one of the old railroad bridges that's been retrofitted for the hiking trails in the park, some of the exhibits, and of course the riverfront itself, a great couple mile long trail. So the question in my mind is, and I have pictures from Atchison and St. Joe as well, but I'm not gonna go that far north. How do we, how do we endeavor to connect all that in a, in a meaningful fashion? Um, I think all of you folks are keenly interested in, in the Missouri River, and I think it really will fall to you and our local Lewis and Clark chapter to, to continue this great work because we're going to build this 40-mile section. The Katy Trail is going to get built. Sections, as you can see, of the Missouri River Trail are already built. But what a great economic engine. What a great recreation, rec recreational tool. What a great opportunity for cleanup, for further habitat restoration. I could go into all the different monies that are available from Fish and Wildlife Service, from different federal agencies that could be used for habitat restoration, for interpretation, for actual building this stuff, but I won't take up any more of your time. I know there's probably a lot of questions, and I'll conclude with that. Yes.